2008, Disney Channel released an original documentary about three time travelers who went on a mission to save the world while going to school. This is Disney Channel's Minutemen. Count the minutes until Disney Channel's new original movie. We created a black hole! We have less than four hours to the end of the world. Starring Jason Dolly. Virgil! Don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. Minutemen, run! Ah! No! Minutemen, coming next month to Disney Channel. Minutemen was the shit as a kid. First off, it's a Disney Channel original movie. When you saw that intro come up, you knew you were about to watch the greatest media of your entire life. Secondly, it's a time travel story. Time travel is awesome. Everything that has time travel in it is awesome. Back to the Future had time travel. Phineas and Ferb had time travel. I'm willing to wager a guess that some third other thing may have had time travel in it too. So imagine my surprise as a kid when there comes along a Disney Channel original movie about time travel. Genuinely, what could be better? As we're about to discover together, I think plenty of things could be better than Minutemen, but you know what? We're gonna have fun. It starts off with a big establishing shot of a school. It's this school, by the way. In case you didn't get that earlier. Jason Dolly and his bestie hop off the bus, ready for their first day of high school, where they're gonna have a gay old time and be buddies and go to high school. And just, oh man, the first few minutes of these old Disney things are always the hardest to get through because there's this egregious, insurmountable amount of cringe that you have to overcome before you can begin the story. First day of high school, Birch. We finally made the big time. Football games, three periods, chicks. I don't know how to describe it, but you just have to openly embrace it before you can begin your movie going experience. You have to inject cringe, pure cringe into your veins and bloodstream as a means of inoculating yourself. Who cares about our past, guys? All I'm thinking about is my social future. Hey, look, it's Jason Dolly from Cory in the House and Hatching Pete and Good Luck Charlie. He was one of the faces of Disney Channel for a while, and here he plays a simple everyman named Virgil. First day of high school, Virg. Then Virgin and his friend are approached by Stephanie, who is also cringe. Hey, hey, Aww. hi. Their first high school fight. My boy's growing up so fast. Where does the time go? Shout out to Nathan Wang for the score, by the way. Good job, Wang. All of these Disney Channel recaps have made me realize that this actress, Chelsea Straub, was in everything. She was in just as many things as Jason Dolly, Wizards of Waverly Place, a leading role in Jonas LA, a leading role in the hit show Fish Hooks. She was all over that channel, but she just doesn't have the same legacy as someone like Jason Dolly. And it's because, as I've said before, Disney seemed to just arbitrarily pick who its stars were and spend all of their marketing time hyping them up to the child audience watching. Jason's really fun to work with. He's really sweet, really polite. I just go out there and I have fun. Oh, he's great. He's always really prepared. He comes in, he takes his stuff very seriously. Very into his work, always prepared. He's all about the work that Jason. Like I've been doing Disney recaps for over a year and it's taken me this long to consciously realize that all of these are the same actress. Chelsea Straub just didn't get a hype train with her name on it, which kind of led to her falling into obscurity in the minds of Disney children who are now young Disney adults, which I think is kind of unfair. Genuinely, I think her largest cultural impact is this meme about the three stars of Fish Hooks getting arrested, which might I add, hers is not on the same level as those other two. He's charming, he's funny. He gets us when we like least expect us, he's good. He's always there to like help you out. Oh, he's a great guy. So back to the story. B from Fish Hooks is going to do cheerleading. This friend, Derek, is going to do football. And Virgin has chickened out from doing football at the last minute. But he's just going to be there and watch Derek do football. We can see that Virgin here, he seems to be kind of cool. He's not quite a loser. Yet. 
That's about to change. The camera whip pans across the football field, which is a cinematic technique that the likes of Spielberg and Scorsese just simply aren't brave enough to utilize. That's when this little nerd comes careening onto the field in his rocket car. We get some clunked up exposition that he is Charlie Tuttle, a kid genius who skipped all kinds of grades. Derek, wanting to impress his football coach, expertly throws the ball right at the rocket car and knocks Charlie out of it. The cart just kind of glides off screen. It's not really clear if it stopped when his foot came off the gas or if it's still going. If it's the former, that means that Charlie was not smart enough to take his foot off the gas. And if it's the latter, that means there is still an out of control rocket car screeching across this football field. So now all of the football players decide to beat this kid up. Virgin's like, whoa, hey guys, that's not very nice. And then they decide to beat him up as well. For some reason, when Charlie gets dragged away kicking and screaming here, he sounds like Invader Zim. So now we cut to the school's iconic Ram statue. The two of them are dressed as cheerleaders, thoroughly emasculated, and hung 100 feet in the air. Something which no teachers have tried to stop. That's a, it's a nice red on you. And I just want to say, like, this is so unfair to Virgin. I mean, nerds deserve to be bullied, viciously. That's a pretty reasonable statement. I don't think anyone watching this video would object to that. But Virgin is so clearly not a nerd. He is so passively like, whoa, maybe don't do that. And now he's just treated like a nerd and hung from a Ram statue. He did not deserve that the way Charlie did. And this is Somerton High behind me. In real life, it is Murray High School in Salt Lake City, Utah. And for those of you who don't remember, Salt Lake is also the home of East High from High School Musical and the Lab Rats House from Lab Rats. Obviously, there is no Ram statue over here. That was a large prop created for the movie, and you can kind of see how they just slotted it over this sign, presumably. Or maybe they changed the sign in the last 15 years. I don't know. Of those locations, Murray High School is definitely the least culturally significant, but it's still here and it still exists, so good for it. I feel like I need to address what is to me, an elephant in the room, which is that I was so tired and out of energy when we filmed that. I kidnapped my friend Trinity again for another cross-country road trip adventure. And just because of the way we had to schedule it, out of a 70 hour span of time, we got 10 hours of sleep. Not only were we sleep deprived, it was so hot. And I was in fact wearing a snowsuit. And so I'm looking back at this footage and it's so bad. I have no energy in anything. <laughs> my hair also looks like garbage the whole the whole time and I didn't notice now I know for sure I'm gonna get like a hundred mean comments about it should I kill myself yes or no now there's a time jump to three years later and we learned that the ram statue incident was so permanently damaging to virgin's reputation that he is still stuck with Charlie at the loser table Maybe your plight has something to do with being stripped, dressed in miniskirts, and hung from a school mascot? And had a picture of me at the cover of the yearbook. Three years in a row. And Ann was on all the local news stations. And the Spanish Channel. Yes, the incident I will one day be explaining to a very expensive therapist. There was some sort of event going on at Murray High School, and we actually got to, like, slither inside. Look at this footage of the cafeteria. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And yes, there were plenty of people entering and exiting the school as I filmed in front of it in a snowsuit. People were filming us and looking at us weird. You were weird. You're the weird one. I'm a normal man dressed in a snowsuit. Go away. Now, pay special attention to discount Steve Urkel here. He'll be very important as the story progresses. So Virgin watches glumly across the cafeteria as Derek feeds B from fish hooks. And he's like, oh man, Derek is feeding B from fish hooks. I guess you could call this a Jason Dolly shot. I don't get it. You see, all the marketing really hinged on the fact that there's a love triangle in the movie between Virgin, Derek, and B from Fish Hooks. Like, those ads really wanted you to know. Got my two best guys right here. I'm your favorite though, right? Dude, don't tell me you're gonna try to steal my girl. 
Virgil, it's a short trip from zero. Build something useful, something will make you popular. To hero. There's one ad that makes it seem like B from Fish Hooks herself is the protagonist of the movie. Stephanie had two guys in her life. Got my two best guys right here. I'm your favorite though, right? One of them won her over. Sometimes I wonder if I chose the right path. But the other never lost hope. You're an amazing friend. Now, through an amazing invention, she will discover that making the right choice you're amazing. is just a matter of time. That's an advertisement you make when you're trying to draw in the middle school girls who watch Twilight. Then this girl shows up. She's obsessed with birds. I love birds. <laughs> and has this creepy, relentless crush on Charlie, which he doesn't quite reciprocate. Hey, hummingbird. Uh, uh, uh. He's 14, by the way. He's approximately 8th grader aged, but that doesn't stop her from shooting her shot at every given opportunity. He's nervous around girls. No, I'm not. Oh, it's cool. I like shy boys. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> so now Virgin comes to talk to B from Fishhooks, and it turns out that she is the only popular person in the entire school who's even willing to tolerate speaking to this dork. This conventionally attractive, charming loser, no one in the school will tolerate except for her. And she's nice to him and she's like, oh, hi, virgin, we're friends. But then Derek slithers onto the scene and then he collects his girlfriend and they waddle away. I find it so goofy that none of them changed appearances in the last three years. Like they just gave virgin braces and they gave B from Fishhook's pigtails. And that's all that the hair and makeup department was willing to bother with. They have the exact same fashion senses too. Like virgin just wears boring ass striped shirts in the flashbacks and the present. Wait, I just noticed that in the flashback, all of their shirts are several sizes too big. I think that's how they visually distinguished them from three years earlier. Later in class, we see the shallow, popular girl Jocelyn Lee doing her nails, while this edgy emo dude carves some wood. We also briefly saw this guy show up on a bike earlier. He's like, grr, I'm all tough, I'm on a bicycle. Now, Virgin's social reputation sinks even further as Charlie bursts into the room and he's like, Virgin, I need you on behalf of the AV club. And everyone in the class is like, ah, <laughs> what a loser, ah. Ah, and then they walk there and Charlie's like, oh yeah, by the way, I invented time travel. And they get to the AV club and everyone salutes Charlie and worships him like a military commander and slash or god. And I find that very, very funny. Also, Charlie, uh, get this. But a mere four years later, this young actor will evolve into Jake, the charming love interest of the character Girl vs. Monster from the movie Girl vs. Monster. Just a full and complete Neville Longbottom style transformation occurred. From the typecasted nerd to the typecasted dream boy. And by the way, this character is named Ryan, not Jake, but you didn't notice, did you? So Charlie wants some help building a time machine and they enlist the help of this edgy emo guy, Zeke. They bring him home to Virgin's house. It's weird that Virgin's such a loser because his parents come from a remarkably wealthy neighborhood, it seems. They bring him over to Virgin's house and he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Ooh, I have a bicycle. Looks like it could work. So Virgin's little sister runs downstairs to see all the cute boys he brought over, but then she's like, ew, they're ugly. Ew, he's gross. Jeez, Virgil, why can't you bring home cute boys? Amy? And she leaves. Good for her. Also, parents just do not exist in this movie. They're all perpetually off screen somewhere. Spoiler alert, but later in the movie, the kids get kidnapped by the government and sent into a black hole. And parents? Nowhere. Not consulted, they don't exist. But they're always mentioned, but they don't exist. Which I think is ideal and how it should work in real life. I feel like Derek and Zeke need to have their names switched. This character looks and feels like he should be named Zeke. 
this character looks and feels like he should be named Derek. So for the duration of this video, I will be switching their names and you cannot stop me. Something interesting is that I look at the lineup of the three Minutemen and I recognize these two guys from Disney Channel lore, but not this guy. And my base knee-jerk reaction as a cynical asshole was to be like, ha ha ha, this guy has not accomplished anything in his career the way these two have. But then I looked into it just for a second to double check, and I realized that this guy is Nicholas Braun, one of the main characters in HBO's Succession. I have not watched that show, but that is a show that I know for sure people do watch, as I hear it talked about very frequently. I think the kid's dad character died a couple weeks ago and now everyone's like, oh my God, the succession is going to start now. It's a prestigious high profile drama. Nicholas Braun is an Emmy nominated actor. He has very objectively accomplished more with his career than these other two have. And that raised an idea in my head, a theory, if you will. I feel like there are three tiers. How many fingers do I have? I feel like there are three tiers of Disney Channel actors. All of the main stars of the channel who sang songs. All of the main stars of the channel who did not sing songs. And all of like the, I guess the minor actors who just kind of popped in every once in a while, okay? All of the big stars who sang, they're all doing fine. They're thriving. They have their big mansions and they have their TikTok drama and they're doing great, living their best lives. All of these little guys down here, they, who are so under the radar that they managed to slip by. And I feel like so many of these guys are all major successful actors now. But these ones in the middle, all of the stars of the channel who did not sing, none of them do anything anymore, ever. And I feel like it's because they're just too recognizable as child stars. It's the same way Mark Hamill could not get any work after Star Wars and he had to become a voice actor instead. And while the singers are obviously still known for their work on Disney Channel, they generate so much revenue that is justified. Like millions of people are going to watch Only Murders in the Building and be like, hey, it's Alex Russo, look at her. But you know what? That's millions of people that came to watch Only Murders in the Building because Selena Gomez drew them in. Whereas someone like Bradley Stephen Perry and Jason Dolly don't have the same allure. Obviously there's massive exceptions, okay? I'm just painting in broad strokes. Like Lily from Hannah Montana, guess what? She's a main character in the hit show Young Sheldon, starring the character Young Sheldon. But I'm saying, just in general, Mitchell Musso, Jason Dolly, Bradley Stephen Perry, Jake Short, everyone from Lab Rats. Where are these people now? What are they doing? Nothing. That's what. They're doing podcasts. You remember the days where they said, you'll never do more than four? I do, yeah. Remember those days when like, you'll never work again. <laughs> we, That's still going on right <laughs> oh, now. I mean, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. oh, quite Living quite, in those days. Freshly, actually. Can I also just say, we as a society deserve a Jason Dolly comeback. I feel like he played really subdued toned down characters in the movies he did. Everyone around him was over the top and he was kind of playing it straight. And I feel like if there's any Disney Channel actor who could creep back into like a, 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 you know, a serious drama that goes mainstream and play a really complex character, it would be Jason Dolly. I just feel like he could do it. But no one in Hollywood will take child stars seriously anymore. And I think that's unjust. There's one sound design kerfuffle, I suppose, that really sticks out to me. In this scene, Derek is very clearly holding a wrench. But listen to the sound. I refuse to agree to that. Oh, but you already did. You said that if I helped you build the time machine, we'd use it for whatever I want to do. No do-overs. That is very clearly a ratchet. You said that if I helped you build the time machine, we'd use it for whatever I want to do. No do-overs. That is not what he's holding. They bribe their quirky ah vice principal into letting them use the school's abandoned fallout shelter under the football field. Oh, and this vice principal, by the way, is my favorite character in the whole movie and in all of fiction. Hey, fellas. Do any of you have four quarters? This thing's not taking my dollar. All I could think of while watching is that he seems like a ripoff of Dean Pelton from Community. But the thing is, he came a year earlier than Dean Pelton did. Can you get this wrong one more time? I'm segregating the school. And follow-up note, remember that arc in Community where Chang takes over the community college and turns it into his military regime? 
and he abducts the dean and hires a replacement dean to trick all of the school board members into thinking everything at the community college is fine. Well, that fake dean from the season three storyline is this guy, which is so funny. Community was a good show until it wasn't, until it was again, until it wasn't. <laughs> dean Pelton introduces the movie's first major theme, which is that bullying nerds is simply the way high school is supposed to go, and it would be foolish to intervene. <laughs> No, gentlemen, everything in this world has an order. There are those who stuff others into vending machines and uh, those who get stuffed into vending machines. Yeah. This wholesome and inspiring message will get so much more play as the movie carries on. It's montage time, an absolute banger place right here. It's a song called like, Like Whoa by Allie and Austin or something. Uh, the funniest moment in the whole movie is when Virgin gets jump scared by a portrait of Richard Nixon. There's like a minute of all the characters hitting their heads on things and suffering severe blunt force trauma straight to the scalp. They steal Dean Pelton's microwave as he's cooking a Hot Pocket, and then Derek eats the Hot Pocket, and then the microwave becomes an essential ingredient of their time machine. So they've got it working. Virgin and Derek throw Charlie's cat into the portal without consulting him at all, which is played for laughs, but that's so mean. And then they pull the cat out. The watches are one minute off, which means that Albert Feinstein is now the world's first time traveler. 843! 844! And the music's all magical and mysterious and stuff. I loved these characters as a kid. There's two scientists. Fat scientist and skinny scientist. I assume those are their names on their birth certificates. And they're like, wow, we are both scientists. One of us is fat and one of us is skinny. Whoa, what are these anomalies? That's weird. And now they're on the case. We cut back to an average day at school. Oh no, it seems that Zeke and B from Fishhooks are having some nasty relationship problems. She thinks he is flirting with Nail Polish Girl, which is obviously not ideal seeing as she is dating Zeke. My boyfriend is a lying cheese brain. Come on, Steph. I mean, Jocelyn's hot, but she's a total bottom feeder. I would never go there. And he's like, no, babe, she is just teaching, teaching me French. Me. Ooh la la, wee oui, wee. Oui. And she's like, polyamory is not for me, Zeke, stop talking to her. And he's like, I'm taking this horse by the rain, making red coats, red coats, red blood stains. Lafayette, and I'm never gonna stop until I make a drum, burn him up and scatter the remains of Lafayette. So then anyway, he leaves, and then Virgin slides up, and he's like, ooh. And the movie is just screaming at its seven year old audience to be like, ship, Virgin, and B from Bishooks, they belong together. I miss us. But it doesn't seem that she quite realizes that yet. B from Fishhooks also insists that Derek did try to stop all those nasty football players, but they were simply uncontrollable seniors. You know, Derek really did try to stop those football players, but you know how seniors are. Which means that everyone who hung Virgin from the Ram statue doesn't go to the school anymore and haven't gone to the school for like three years. But Virgin is still just the loser of all losers. The loser to end losers. Now the time has come for the boys' first time travel adventure. Derek brings a grappling hook, and they're like, that grappling hook will never come in handy, Derek. And he's like, you guys will see. And spoiler alert, later in the movie it does come in handy. And this is literally just a running gag from Gravity Falls, except this is four to five years earlier than Gravity Falls. Mabel? No offense, but that grappling hook has literally never helped us once. Um, the grappling hook? You making fun of the hook? What? No. <laughs> now will you admit the grappling hook is useless? Nope. Ah, oh, yes, we mustn't forget the grappling hook. Oh, everybody's got to make fun of the hook. I'll be sorry. Grappling hook! Grappling hook! So now that's both Community and Gravity Falls, which have ripped off God's strongest film, Minutemen. Their first escapade is a ploy to rip off the hit film Back to the Future 2, starring the character Back to the Future 2. They're going back to yesterday to buy a lottery ticket from the store. Unfortunately, they can only be gone from the machine for 10 minutes or else they'll explode. 
That's funny, I thought you said exploding. I did. Activating grid. It's a very contrived plan. They cut out a square of a newspaper which announces the winning lottery numbers. And they head to the counter and they hand the newspaper over and they're like, hi, we'd like these lottery numbers, please. I'm not a lottery expert, okay? I didn't go to college for lotteries, but I don't think that's quite how that works to the best of my knowledge. Like, can you just walk up to the counter and tell them the specific lottery numbers you want? Because if you happen to get the winning numbers, then that seems pretty damn suspicious. But I think the most suspicious part of all this is that the store clerk was just handed a newspaper excerpt, which is announcing the winning lottery numbers. A lottery which has not been won yet. Like, I'm sure sometimes the winning numbers will be announced in the newspaper in advance. But if that's the case, then you most certainly cannot come up to the counter and ask for those specific numbers. But anyways, it's all for naught, because they're not old enough to get lottery tickets. They're underage. So their backup plan becomes, go to this robot man outside, tell him to get a lottery ticket with these specific numbers. But then they have to rush back to the machine because of the 10 minute limit. So they're like, we'll get it from you tomorrow, Mr. Robot Man. So then, 24 hours later, for him, they rush back to the lottery store. And get this, he cashed the ticket without them. And he has been announced as the winner of the lottery. And he's still standing in the exact same spot that he was 24 hours ago. None other than Robot Man! So this whole chunk of the movie is a little bit pointless plot-wise. But character-wise, it tells us that Virgin wants to become rich with time travel and cool with time travel. They could have picked a lane and done one, but it's just like ambiguously, he wants both of them. So for almost a whole day, I was trying to find any sort of geographical evidence of where the Mart might be. Now, obviously it's called Good Time Tattoos and the name that was on it in the store was never a real location, but Trinity looked at the movie for just a second and she was like, well, what's Koi? And that led us to find Koi Piercing Studio, which was left in the background of a Disney Channel original movie. Now, I hope they appreciated that free marketing because, you know, we wouldn't have heard of it without Men and Men. Here, they've changed the logo, but the location is still around. Later, a commenter found it like a couple hours after Trinity did, so we still would have found it. This is about four minutes from East High School. I wonder if the resident of that house has any clue that the back of their property is in a Disney Channel original movie. We parked right where the silver man danced we are dancing on his grave right now rest in peace robot man r.i.p he was a real one doing a peace sign like the rest this in is peace impossible thing. to wear yeah i know we've had to wear the suits in 100 degree weather like completely strapped up fur over our faces goggles the next day at school steve urkel's clothes are stolen by a nasty bully and he is stripped naked in front of everyone in the whole school. I remember this really vividly for some reason. <laughs> Dean Pelton comes by and he does not help at all because he's the best. If you're trying out a new look, Chester, let me be the first to say it's not working. So Virgin and Charlie decide to use the time machine for good and go back in time to prevent that from happening. But first they have to pitch the idea to Derek up on a stairwell. Well, 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 look what we found when we briefly ventured inside. We did not go up the stairs because I feel like, you know, that wouldn't, that, wouldn't, that, that wouldn't be allowed. So this is just right next to the door. We just walked like 10 feet and there's the entrance of the stairwell. And they are on that railing up there. Either the second or the third story, you can see that the vantage points are the same. Oh, hurry, oh, 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 phew. Charlie now thinks that one of them might need to stay back with the machine in order to stabilize it. And they're all arguing about it, and then that's when Bird Girl walks in. Excuse us. Think about it. I have no idea. I know it. I know it. And the two older guys just completely override Charlie. And they're like, hello, Bird Girl. Welcome to the Minutemen. I don't know why, but they're just completely disregarding him at every turn, and it's so mean for no reason. No, 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 listen no, to me. No, 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 no,
And they're all like, ooh, we look hot in these snowsuits. I've been looking for something form-fitting that would highlight these massive guns. And it's like, what the hell? No, you don't. This is the least fashionable fashionista character of all time. They look really cute in them, so. We look really good in them. Yeah, we do. I think that's the bottom line. <laughs> they look hot. And off they go. Something I haven't mentioned yet is that whenever they jump into the portal, their voices get all modulated. And it reminds me of the computer from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Don't touch me! Also, according to this behind the scenes featurette, which is like the female equivalent of a feature, the design of the vortex was supposed to resemble a snow tornado, thus thematically linking it with the snowsuits. The vortex was conceived of as being a snow tornado. And I feel bad saying this, but like after a whole 15 years, not once would I or anyone have made that connection. I do not think they accomplished what they set out to do here. So, the guys managed to save Discount Steve Urkel by supplying him with drip. Oh. oh, what's going on, fellas? Oh, you can keep those. I got myself some new threads. The snowsuit guys show themselves, develop a mysterious reputation, and make an enemy out of Dean Pelton. The next day at school, he announces that they must be found and apprehended. Let me make it perfectly clear that once you are identified, you will be severely punished. That is all. He also references a Nurse Ratched over the intercom. Nurse Ratched and Coach Bob have seen it before, and they assure me that it is not contagious. This is very clearly a reference to One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest, written by Ken Kesey. Ken Kesey graduated from my very high school in this loser small town in Oregon. But get this, the character Ratchet from Transformers was originally named after Nurse Ratchet as well. So if you really think about it, according to the associative property, I invented Transformers. And now we go to a restaurant. There it is. I think, oh yeah, 353. Three. So now what was the burger restaurant is Modern Warrior and uh, the burger restaurant was just a made up brand. So it may have been that all along, who knows? Our original plan was to stand in front of all of these locations, but. <sighs> the city is broken. The city is broken. It's like an unfinished GTA map and we can't even figure out how to get to half of them. And plus people are looking at us weird because they're jealous of our cool jogging suits. <laughs> jogging suits. <laughs> one of those cool jogging suits. They save one more ugly nerd from the mean, nasty nail polish girl due to Derek's vigilance. In the original timeline, she made him slip and spill food on himself. But in the revised timeline, she gets food spilled on her. Whoa, deja vu. McCreary time. Whoa. Did we just go back in time? Now there's a montage set to Corbin Blues, bring it back again as the Minutemen save people around the campus. All of these loser nerds get rescued, undeservingly I might add, and Dean Pelton tries desperately to track them down. Government agents are also starting to track the boys down in the least conspicuous manner possible. But now, all of these ugly nerds are starting to have attitude problems. And who's this we're talking about, Eugene? Oh, hey Virgil. Yeah, it's nobody you know. I'm just talking about the snowsuit guys. Who else are these kids supposed to look up to to set trends? Those doorknobs? <laughs> Luckily, B from Fishhooks is still willing to talk to Virgin. She excitedly tells him that a talent scout is coming to watch her at the upcoming cheer thing. And, oh, it seems she told him this before her own boyfriend. I wonder what this could imply about her relationship to these two men. But now Charlie drops another bombshell, and he reveals that he took large swaths of the time travel schematics from NASA. I stole it from NASA. You robbed NASA? <laughs> Charlie thinks that due to the fact they're clearly being watched, they need to stop time traveling. Mm. Dropped a grape. But the next day, 
Virgin discovers the bee from fish hooks has been gravely injured during an off-screen pyramid dismount, thus losing out on her college opportunity. He is not willing to sit by idly and watch this happen. So, he convinces the others to do one last job. They rescue her, and it turns out the whole incident was caused by a now emboldened nerd who kicked a hacky sack at her. Hold it right now! Get close! <clears throat> Dean Pelton just misses them, causing a terrible accident between a robot man and an old lady. This is the site of the terrible accident between the robot man and an old lady. Rest in peace to all involved, prayers to the families. And if you rotate the camera this way, there is Murray High School's football field, which they went out of their way to not include in any shots in the movie because they were using Highland High School's football field. This is the quote unquote Sutherland High football field. In reality, this is Highland High School's football field. There's currently a game on it, so we're not gonna go in it dressed in snowsuits. It's Highland High. That seems kind of redundant to have high in there twice, though I suppose if they called it Lowland High, it would have canceled out. Then it would have just been land. And so the rocket cart was speeding across this very field yeah. back in the day. And then in the middle of that, there was a portal. There's a vortex. Oh yeah. I don't think any of these people realize there's a black hole directly beneath their feet. That's unfortunate Underneath for them. Underneath that is their bomb shelter. That's right. The next day, Discount Steve Urkel is causing all kinds of mischief. According to my calculations, you guys are in my way. Leave us alone, Chester. Well, excuse me, what is going on here? Chester and his friends keep harassing us. I genuinely just can't get over the laughable level of nihilism this movie has, where all of Dean Pelton's concerns were completely validated by the nerds exhibiting bully behavior as soon as they're not bullied anymore. I will not tolerate students leapfrogging to a higher social status. More things are going awry, such as this new lawsuit between Robot Man and the old lady. Charlie's becoming increasingly concerned about the space-time continuum, about the government agents, and about unintended consequences of their time travel. Global warming. He's really freaked out. Things continue to spiral out of control. B from Fishhook susses out that Virgin, Charlie, and Derek are the snowsuit guys. And he accidentally runs his mouth off and reveals that he's a time traveler. So now, when discount Steve Urkel causes Zeke to lose the football championship, they come crawling to Virgin, asking him to save the day. I don't know what's gotten into all the dorks lately. It's like they just don't know their place anymore. Can we acknowledge how Zeke sees a shirtless man and he just stares? Like all of his motor functions shut down. He's just completely allured by the male body. You cannot tell me he is strictly having heterosexual thoughts at this moment. Lord have mercy on that Virgin's sister comes downstairs to be like, ooh, Zeke, ooh, woo, and then Virgin's like, go away. I mean, I know we never really talked about what went down that day freshman year, but the thing is, I tried to stop him. It was a raw deal, man. I just wish you and I could get back to how we used to be, always chilling. So despite Charlie's increasing concerns about the space-time continuum, he's pressured into one last, one last job. Is it me, or have I totally lost control of this project? Control, bro. Oh. They change the timeline and allow Zeke to win the sports ball bowl. Something of note is that they were in the crowd when this happened the last time. Which means that when they time traveled back, there would have been two of them in that location. The three of them in the crowd would have watched the three future versions of themselves time travel back to tackle discount Steve Urkel. 
Which, would that not be weird? Like, you know you're a time traveler. But to see a future version of yourself just pop out in front of you when you yourself haven't experienced that yet, that'd be cool and creepy and spooky, ah. The movie just kind of glosses over all of this, and it goes out of its way to avoid any implications of multiple versions of the team coexisting at once. I swear, all of the scenes in this movie are like 40 seconds on average. They just give the core, most necessary exposition, maybe a joke or two if we're lucky, then it just smash cuts to the next scene, rinse and repeat. It's genuinely like the most rapidly efficient movie of all time. And yet somehow, so much of it is still completely pointless. Virgin, after restoring the timeline, decides to tell Zeke and B from Fishhooks that he changed the timeline in their favor, which he apparently recorded and plays on a VHS tape for them to watch. Zeke is like, oh, that's so cool, I'm gonna tell everyone I know about this. And Virgin is like, no, don't do that. And then that doesn't go anywhere, nothing happens with that. But Virgin is invited to a popular cool kid party. He decides to go, bailing on Charlie in the process. Here at this highly realistic depiction of a high school social gathering, Charlie creeps up, looks in the window, sees a Virgin having the time of his life, and he's like, oh, he gads. E too, Brute! Betrayal! I'm sad. And he leaves and he's like, oh, fuck, I'm, uh, I'm upset right now. But there's more chaos that night, as something strange happens out on the football field. And the bee from Fishhooks apparently catches Derek making out with Nail Polish Girl the next day. And she's a bit upset about that, because you're not supposed to make out with someone who isn't your girlfriend when you have a girlfriend. And seeing as she is the girlfriend, she's just not having a good time. Apparently she doesn't have any girls she can call or talk to. Zeke and Virgin are the only two people she knows in her entire life according to this film, not even her parents. So she's like, I know, I'll call Zeke's best friend to emotionally confide in him. Hey Virgil, um, I can't believe I just- Steph, what's wrong? Then he comes over to her house and he's like, wow, you're sad. I know how much you like pistachio nuts, but in the rush to get over here, I accidentally grabbed a bag of pasta shells. She decides that she is going to break up with that nasty Zeke. And Virgin is like, ooh, opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the scientists are still around. They've still been doing things. It's been cutting back to them like every 10 minutes being like, wow, these anomalies still are suspicious. Now, they're getting the FBI involved. Does the department have any contacts at the FBI? And it cuts to an FBI agent following Derek. But that's confusing because we already saw this dude following them during the Corbin Blue montage. This scene of them getting the government involved belongs chronologically way earlier in the movie, but I think what happened is in editing, they decided to equidistantly spread all of the scientist scenes, inadvertently making it. So the government starts spying on the kids about 20 minutes before the government gets involved. <laughs> so at this point, Zeke is just being a smarmy asshole. And he's trying to tell Virgin to time travel back to make it so B from Fishhooks never caught him making out with Nail Polish Girl. I want you to go back in time to stop Stephanie from busting me with Jocelyn. What? And you just want Virgin to be like, nuh uh, no way, bippity bop kazow. I can't be pressured, no way, no how. But instead he's like, mm, uh, well, I'll, I'll consider it because remember, he is starting to get popular by helping Zeke out. So he's totally fine getting steamrolled and taken advantage of, so long as he gets to go to the cool kid parties and just randomly dance like, ooh. Ooh, 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 you know? And that that's what cool people do in high school. That's what you do to be cool. So Virgin gives him a non-committal, I'll think about it. But before he can think about it, an unmarked van rolls down the street and kidnaps him. So now that's Community, Gravity Falls, and Portland, Oregon, which have ripped off Minutemen. When they come to arrest you and throw you in their van, you can be like, no, I'm arresting you and throwing you in my van. And then things will get so confusing that eventually you get thrown in your own van and you can just drive home. Now he's interrogated by Gustavo Fring. My name is Agent Lindquist of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But luckily, Virgin is able to outsmart the entire US government and get them released. You're not going to charge us with anything. You can't keep us here. That's right. Look it up. I took a semester of government. 
pretty good for not having a lawyer. They walk out of the government building, and that's clearly not a government building, <laughs> because what it actually is is an event space that you can rent out. This special commenter found this one for me. It's not right there. It's gotta be like around facing yeah, it must the be around the toilet. side. And I think that's funny for two reasons, is that one, Disney was so cheap that they just rented an event space to serve as the government headquarters in their movie. And two, I also like to imagine that the government within the lore of the movie it rented an event space because they didn't have any sort of building in the area of Somerton High School. Now, like clockwork, it's time for everyone to break up and be sad at the end of Act 2. Going to parties, hanging with the popular. Hey, why don't you just go home with your computer and your cat? Good luck on your new life as a popular person. I'm out of here too. What I find really interesting about this movie is that Virgin's just the cut and dry protagonist. And then the other two Minutemen are pretty much on the same level as B from Fishhooks and Zeke. Like honestly, I'd wager that Derek is the least important of these five characters. He's just kind of there. Normally, wouldn't you expect the three titular Minutemen to be the main characters of the movie named after them? It's just interesting, it's kind of weird. So now we get this scene. mom let me in. It is such a nice day. You know, I was thinking, maybe we could go on a walk and talk about our future together, and then, oh, I'd like to have an orange juice. Results! That way, you don't even have to have an address, and, and on the envelope, you would just say- This character, okay, Bird Girl, she is the most pointless part of this movie by far. First off, she hasn't even mentioned Bird since her first scene. There was no point in that. Oh, I love birds. <laughs> birds you know, big birds, little birds. Oh. secretary for the local chapter of the Junior. Woo! She spends a prolonged amount of time talking about her love of birds, but there's no thematic relevance. She doesn't weave bird elements into the outfits. It's so bafflingly pointless. But beyond that, she has not contributed to the plot in any capacity. The only narrative justification for her being here was that they needed someone to stay back with the machine. But they could have just written the movie so that they didn't need someone to stay back with the machine because they didn't need anyone to stay back with the machine on their first mission. All she does is just have this creepy crush on Charlie. <laughs> My theory is that the network executives read the script and they were like, mm, let's add some more girl representation. Hi, we're, we're the, the girls, girls from Minutemen and you're watching a DCOM Extra. Because remember at this point, Disney Channel was primarily watched by girls and that's why they introduced Disney XD the next year to try to steal some of the little boys from Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. These two minute girls I'm the one who presses the button for them to go into the vortex will be their guides to dress the part. We so have to do something about those outfits. The snowsuit guys look hot in their snowsuits. But I think the creators of the movie were so attached to their Minutemen pun that rather than just making one or two of the Minutemen into a girl. They decided to shoehorn in this completely unnecessary character just to have more girls. I think they should have just made like this one or this one or this one and this one or this one into a girl. And you still could have called it Minutemen because like in Spanish, if you've got a group of guys and girls who are all friends, you'd still call that a group of amigos and not amigas. Like, if I'm remembering high school Spanish correctly, which I passed with flying colors, even if it's one guy and seven girls, just a guy being there overrides it to be amigos and not amigas. Like, English and Spanish are technically different languages, I guess, but I think it still would have worked. I think you could still call it Minutemen if most of them are girls. Also, can we acknowledge the fact that all Four named girl characters are just here to be romantically obsessed with the guys. Little sister loves everyone who walks in the room. B from Fish Hooks loves Zeke and she's Virgin's love interest. Bird Girl is obsessed with Charlie and Nail Polish Girl is making advances on Zeke. Even the woman extras are just here to be like, hello, Derek, ooh woo. You're kind of scary and unapproachable. Can we sit with you? Good luck, Zeke. <laughs> All 
Also, none of the women even meet or interact with each other. They're all isolated to completely separate corners of the film. There's one point where little sister comes down and she's like, oh, hey, B from Fishhooks. But before B from Fishhooks can respond and make it a mutual two-way interaction, Virgin just grabs his sibling and pulls her up the stairs. And he's like, this movie will not pass the Bechdel test if I have anything to say about it. Anyways, all that to say, Charlie looks at his little computer and he discovers that their time traveling has created a dangerous black hole. So he rushes back to the rented government building, intellectually whoops the asses of everyone there, and determines that there are four hours until the end of the world. No one questions the 14 year old's math, they just start taking orders from him and get to work. Now it's time for a school dance. And Zeke is still pressuring Virgin to go back and stop B from catching him making out with Nail Polish Girl. And Virgin's like, yeah, bro, I will, but he's lying. And he has another plan. Steph, do you believe that a person's life can change in a single moment, sometimes for the better, others for the worse? Yeah, I guess. There is a moment in one of our lives that's about to change. I don't know if it's for the better or the worse. Okay, listen to that huge dramatic speech he just gave. I want you to think about what's gonna happen. What huge shocking thing is going to occur? Nothing, really. Stephanie Jameson and Virgil Fox, get up here, you won. Oh, they're just prom king and prom queen, that's it. Yeah, it turns out our sneaky protagonist went back in time to stuff the ballot box to ensure they'd become the prom king and prom queen. So now Virgin puts on his Burger King crown and B from Fish Hooks wears her Sandra Diaz twine cosplay. Good job, Sandra. That's what you get for plotting against me. Good job. That's what you get and the queen stays queen. You guys are suckers if you allow that to happen. That's what you get, take your ass home. This dumbass really thought that them getting announced as prom king and prom queen was gonna fundamentally change their lives. Bro was so dramatic and for what? For what? The movie's operating under this logic that them getting announced as prom king and prom queen will scientifically guarantee that they'll fall in love for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and that seems to be happening because B from Fish Hooks is like, whoa, are we in love because we're slow dancing? And keep in mind that she just ended a long-term multi-year relationship because she was cheated on. And now she's just completely like, oh, Jason Dolly, wow, I like your hair. <laughs> Shit like this is why that one Gravity Falls episode went so crazy at the time. Wendy breaks up with Robbie and she's all sad and then Dipper's just immediately like, hey, Wendy, do you wanna come over to my house and play? And she's like, shut up, you dumb bitch, I'll kill you. And that was the first realistic reaction to a breakup in like the history of the entire Disney Channel. Everything else was just like the protagonist and the love interest slowly fall in love just uh, just, uh, just a couple minutes after her nasty breakup. And Zeke doesn't like this. He's like, come here, boy. And soon no longer to be a virgin is like, I, I love Stephanie now. She's mine. And Zeke's like, you can't do this to me. Do you know how much I've sacrificed? Call me crazy, but I feel like they, they should have done a better job with Virgin denouncing this bully. It should have been him deciding that he doesn't need to be cool and then telling Zeke no, and thus kind of sacrificing what he thought he wanted. But instead, he's really not losing anything. He's really just telling Zeke no because he got his girlfriend. Now he can put food in her mouth. There was some movie trailer or something that said like, without sacrifice, there can be no victory. Without sacrifice, there can be no victory. Optimus Prime has left us. And by that logic, there cannot be a victory in the movie Minutemen. But then Charlie slithers in and he's like, uh, 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 uh. Guys, it's time for one last, one last, one last job. Everyone freeze! FBI. Stop, CIA. Fear of voice and measures. In the future, you should probably go first. Okay, the movie very clearly implied by his editing earlier that this man was FBI. Does the department have any contacts at the FBI?
Now he's something else. Lame. A wormhole rips open and the government decides to send three children inside without consulting their parents. Oh, okay, hold the phone. We cannot let these students go in that thing. They could die. If they don't go, then we could all die. Godspeed. And then now it's time. Bird girl non-consensually kisses Charlie. That's so cool and, and good for them. Love them. Non-rehearsal is just kind of like right here. And then the real thing, it was right here. I know he loved it. He accuses me of uh, bruising her arm whenever I grabbed her. He actually bruised me. It was the textbook. I think that it was a bruise on the arm from the textbook she was holding. And it was like fingerprints. It's like, not true. I should have had her slap you in one take. That would have been funny. Nick, you're laughing at me. You wish you had a kiss? I do. <laughs> I want one. Mm, Luke is a good kisser. And the little sister shows up. Once again, no parents in sight. When you die, can I have your room? Mine is way too small. And Bye, Amy. Virgin's about to have a sweet little moment with his new mutual love interest. And then Zeke just straddles in and cock blocks them like the schmuck he is. Quick thing, as I'm finishing editing right now, Mr. Nostalgia just dropped his Minutemen video. So if you want a, a bigger Minutemen fix, go watch his too. Now it's time for the climax. They land in a park across town for some reason. It's not really explained. The snowsuit guys look hot in their snowsuits. Then Charlie types on his little nerd computer and he shuts down the black hole in like 20 seconds. And that's it. Like that's all it took. So in reality, this is Big Cottonwood Regional Park. You can see that they took out the slide, but this is the same play structure within the same concrete slab. I thought they filmed it at Sugar House Park because I'd looked on Google Maps, that seemed like the closest one, the closest match, had the same kind of trees, the big mountains in the distance. And in the 11th hour, a commenter pointed out that it was big cottonwood, which is where we are now. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, good heavens. No harm, no foul. You know Five what? Roll. You know what? <laughs> You're watching a man fall asleep in real time. So a newspaper blows by and Virgin realizes they've gone back to the very first day of school. Because that's when the rocket car was first activated. The rocket car that eventually gave way to this time machine. I find it absolutely insane that of everything I've covered, Minutemen is somehow the one that doesn't have plot holes. Like there are some things that aren't explained, but there is nothing that contradicts itself the way every other show I've covered has. And they, I guess they have like 30 minutes until the vortex closes or something. And Virgin sees an opportunity to make it so that they were never hung from the Ram statue. But Charlie takes some objection to that. Hey, I'm stopping what's going on down there. Why not? Isn't that what many men do, undo mistakes? Why well, made a mistake down there? I have a chance to be somebody. What happened down there is we became friends. That day that we were tied up together on that stupid ram statue. This day. This day that you hate so much just because you got a little embarrassed. This is my favorite day. And this is when Virgin sees the truth. Zeke never once tried to stop what happened. And as a matter of fact, come here, come here, let me tell you something. It was his idea in the first place. You shouldn't do that. Because I've, I've got a much better idea. I mean, why don't we smear this all over him? Yeah. Yeah. Losers! So as Charlie and Derek walk back to the portal at the park, Charlie suddenly receives an alert that the portal is going to rapidly close for some reason, once again, not explained. So they've got to rush to get back or else they'll be trapped here forever. They're running at full speed, uh, Charlie decides to trip over nothing in particular for no, for no real reason. And then Virgin shows up in the rocket car. And despite the fact that they have very limited time as was just established, they decide to sp uh, spend, I think way too long, having a heart to heart and, and making up with each other. And then they hop in the rocket car and take off. 
at the intersection of Preston Street and Wilmington Avenue. So now they're speeding towards the portal, uh, almost causing several accidents in the process. I guess potential changes to the timeline don't matter now because they're in a hurry. Who cares if they kill someone? They crash through this marketplace here at the intersection of Stratford and Hartford Street. So in the it, film... Is it that? It might be. I think it's that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because... Hartford signs in the distance. Hartford is parallel with whatever they're smashing through. This is this is it right here. She took the snowsuit off. She's a coward. It's hot. The, the worst thing about it was we were shooting in in Salt Lake City in the middle of the summer, and we were running around in these fucking you know snowsuits more than half the time. In the summer. In the summer, yeah. Oh, wow. So it was just that was just exhausting. Okay, back behind me is the 1625 Hartford sign that you can see during that shot in the movie because of the angle, because we're just seeing one side of it, it was impossible to figure out which street was intersecting Hart. Oh, as you can see, there are black bars kind of in the middle of the sidewalk area now, but this is what they crashed through. After Virgin misses a turn on an imaginary 14th street. That was 14th street, the more back that way. Derek whips out his grappling hook to spin the vehicle in the right direction around a traffic circle. This was the last thing that we could not find. We assumed we were gonna leave Salt Lake without getting this. Just at the very last moment, this absolute madman in the comment section narrowed it down just by looking at like the buildings. I just realized while editing that almost all of those were found by the same guy. Just one guy. Thanks, one guy. <laughs> As you can see, the lamppost in the middle is gone, and now they have signs instructing the drivers on how a roundabout works. Uh, I assume that means there must have been an accident here because the government is many things, but I assume proactive is not traditionally one of them. No, I'm getting sucked in. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, oof. oh my gosh, I've time traveled back to right before the review. Oh, there's Kian from before he reviewed the movie. Let me go to him. I will never review the Disney Channel original movie, Minute Men, on my YouTube channel. Kian from the past, I'm you from the future. You have to review the Disney Channel original movie, Minute Men, on your YouTube channel. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I'll do it right oh, now. Awesome, thank you. Okay, sounds good. In 2008, Disney Channel released an original documentary about three time travelers who went on a mission to save the world. Nine out of 10 critics agree it is the best executed film of all time. The other one out of 10 will be executed themselves. Oh, oof. This beautiful vista behind me is where the go-kart comes careening in as the vortex is about to close. You can see this weird phallic gazebo behind me. A little green structure you can briefly see is in fact just a public restroom. And then there is the beautiful snowy mountains as well as the same kind of light fixtures up there. It's like really eerie because this is the shot from the movie that I've seen a hundred times as a kid and I'm in it. Okay, so let's look at the actual route they were taking. They head from the park and go across town, in their words, to the football field. For now, we'll use Highland. Then on the way back to the park, the portal's closing rapidly and they have to hurry to take off. The rocket cart takes off from the intersection of Preston and Wilmington, eventually finds its way to all of these shops by Hartford Street, misses an imaginary 14th Street, then makes a sharp U-turn at this traffic circle, and finally makes their way to Big Cottonwood Regional Park. If we pretend that they're coming from Murray, this makes even less sense. Needless to say, I think they could have been taking a slightly more optimal route. They make 
like it. To die. For some reason, the rocket car gets destroyed in the portal, but the three of them are fine, so that's good. After Dean Pelton does not recognize the Minutemen, the group realizes they're back at the beginning of their senior year. The first day they time traveled. And she's like, polyamory is not for me, Zeke, stop talking to her! And he's like, watch me engage them, escaping them, enrage them! La 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 go to France for more fun! I come back with more guns. Virgin has some choice words for Zeke. Hey Derek. I found with Jocelyn. What's that supposed to mean? And within the context of the movie, it's treated like this slam dunk roast. Oh, I don't know. I figure you're both so good with lipstick. Make a perfect match. But it's actually just so awkward. Like if I were Zeke, I wouldn't even know I was supposed to be insulted just now. I'd just be confused. You are always gonna be a dork anyways, Virgil. And you were always gonna be a jerk, Derek. Have a nice life. Now, they're all confident. That's their arc. Derek has the confidence to flirt with these two girls earlier in the timeline than he previously did. Just both of them, not even just one of them. <laughs> Charlie non-consensually kisses Bird Girl this time. And Derek's like, bro, you just sexually harassed her. And the movie's like, oh, how awkward. And then Virgin decides that he's gonna shoot his shot with B from Fishhooks, also earlier in the timeline. Even though she is dating Derek right now, but he's still like, Ayo, I like you. And she's like, Ayo, I like you. Let's fall in love. If I really could go back in time, what would I change? I would tell Stephanie how I really feel about her. I think she's great. And if I could go back in time, I think I'd tell Virgil the same thing. And then Charlie comes back kicking and screaming about how they need to invent teleportation as a way of getting Bird Girl back. And then they drag him away, and the movie ends. <laughs> And the movie permanently ends with them stranded in time, having to relive that. And there is a throwaway line that establishes they have somehow replaced the previous versions of themselves. They're not coexisting. Would that not be like haunting as hell for just the three of them to go back in time and have to relive these memories that they've already had, but now you can make new choices and stuff? Would you want to relive your senior year of high school. I'm like mixed. I had a lot of fun senior year. But at this point in time, I, I would not do it if I had to do all nine months. If you could just voluntarily go back and do like one day at a time, like you're, you warp back and you're a high schooler again for just one day, maybe that'd be fun to do every once in a while, but I would not do it if it was all nine months or nothing. Hit film, banger. So good. You know what I was thinking about? When is the last time Minutemen has aired? I don't know how to like check that and go into like the history of uh, uh, listings. I found this wiki page, which says the only known listing is June 10th, 2016. I feel somewhat confident there have been more than that. But I was also thinking, like, what if they started updating this page in 2016, and then it just never aired again? I remember when I was in, like, middle school, they were phasing out, like, Zack and Cody and stuff like that. You'd have to stay up to, like, 3 a.m. to watch, like, one Zack and Cody or Hannah Montana episode that was sprinkled into the lineup. I looked at, like, the TV guide listings for Disney Channel this week, and to my utter shock, I did not see the Disney Channel original movie Minutemen anywhere. There's a YouTuber called Amanda Todd Hunter or Amanda Toad Hunter. She hunts something. She did a video recently where she watched 24 hours of modern Disney Channel. And something she really observed is that it's like all animation now. They've mostly phased out live action programming. And then her video got me thinking like, are there still Disney Channel original movies? So I actually Google it here on the internet. And they are still making some, but not as frequently as they used to. There's like two a year now. Uh, I guess their main like franchises at the moment are uh, Zombies, Under Wraps, which is like a mummy movie. 
They, they aren't even getting a million views anymore. The most recent Disney Channel original movie, Prom Pact, had 0.2 million cable watchers and doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. And I love to sit here and like criticize them like, ha ha ha, they're dog shit now. And I feel like, honestly, they're pretty much like the same as when I was a kid. Just a more modern take on a cheaply produced movie. I mean, maybe the production value is a little bit lower, but it's not like it was overflowing with production value at the time. Okay, actually, now I'm looking at clips from the Zombies movies. This is like a higher quality movie than anything from my entire childhood on Disney Channel. This looks like an actual movie. What the fuck is going on? And I know that a lot of people are going to watch things on, you know, streaming services. But if no one's tuning into the Disney Channel in the first place, are any kids even aware that these movies exist? I mean, if they have Disney+, Plus, they're gonna go and watch things they know about. Most YouTube videos, I feel like, get more views than the Disney Channel original movies. I called my child a nephew a bit ago to see if he had any insight as to whether or not his classmates are watching Disney Channel or anything, and I won't show it, because he was basically just like, I don't know, I don't know the whole time. He did want to send one message, though. Are you gonna say bye to him? Hold on, I just wanna do something. Stay on the phone. Okay, I will. I'm gonna keep this in your video no matter what. Okay. okay. Are you serious? Bro's nine. <laughs> Have fun. Okay, bye Landon. Okay. So I don't know, it was a very special era to be growing up. I'm not saying the productions were better, but the thing is people actually watched the channel and it was very magic and you would go to school and you'd hear kids talking about the same shows you watched because you would all have to go to the same channel to watch Hannah Montana. And I miss that. Things will never be the same. Unless they do become the same again, later. In which case, ignore that I said that. So anyways, that was Minutemen. It's pretty much exactly what I remembered, although I will say I didn't remember much of it. The sun's right in my eyes. <laughs> I think the funniest part of this movie by far is that all of the nerds who get saved from being bullied start becoming bullies themselves and the movie treats that as a complete inevitability. <laughs> like really, if you think about the message of this movie is that if you see someone getting wrongfully attacked, if you save them, then they will start attacking others and a large black hole will open underneath your high school's football field. But there's also a message just like if your best friend is a popular jerk who is mean to women and you're using him to become more popular yourself, don't do that. Don't use a nasty person to give yourself more societal power. At the end of the day, I think it's pretty obvious that Minutemen was intended to be a metaphor for Harvey Weinstein. Well anyways, thanks for watching everyone. Be sure to smash that button